So I have a lot to try to squeeze in today. Uh, so usually I start with a precursor of what we covered last time, but just in the interest of time, I need to immediately get going because I want to wrap up around 8.40, 8.45 and leave time for, for questions if there are any. Um, from where we are now, Rasulullah and the Dawah of Rasulullah is now open. Now everyone knows that Rasulullah uh, is receiving revelation and is a prophet or claiming to be a prophet by the opinion of some of And the first place where I want to start is where the Muslimin would learn and meet. So keep in mind that while the Haram, the Kaaba, is the most sacred place in Islam, the Muslimin could not meet there. While they would have liked to, I imagine, they could not meet there because they would be persecuted there. The Muslimin at this point still had to meet in secret when they wanted to study under the hands of Rasulullah. One of the Muslimin was Al Arqam ibn Abu Arqam. Al Arqam, son of the father of Arqam. So that means he's his father's oldest son. And he opened his house to the Muslimin as effectively the first masjid and the first university in Islam. Now, some of the brothers and I were speaking just before this officially started. And I want you to realize that Dar al the house of al was no more than mud and stone. There was no fancy pillars, there was no giant dome, uh, no loudspeakers, it didn't have any of that. But the quality of people in that place was second to none. It was the best. It had the best generation of Muslimin. That was the generation of Islam that was free of hypocrites. There were no there were no Rafatin in Dar al Allah. So it was a very special place. The reason why we were talking about that is because when you look at a place like this, this Musaba, it's a very humble place. All of you, all of us, have a bigger nicer massage than this, in terms of the stones and the architecture and the lighting and the domes. But the quality of a masjid, the quality of a place, is not determined by its architecture. It's determined by the people in it. When I go and visit my family in Jordan, uh, there's one masjid, I'm not, I'm not going to name it by name, but there's one masjid, it's very fancy, it's beautiful. Uh, but any time that I've prayed there, it's the place where government officials and princes and it's a place where they go and they get photo opportunities with them, right? So my brother and I named it uh, Masjid al Muqawarat, which in English means the, the Masjid of the Intelligence Agencies. Like it's the place where just the people from the government go and uh, of course good people go there as well, but generally you don't feel, you, you don't feel quite comfortable there. It feels like a display. There are other recessions that I've been to in the same country that are always full, door to door. You can barely get a place. And you barely know from outside that it's a masjid. It's built into some old part of the neighborhood somewhere, but the quality of people there, the musalli and the teachers, the quality is incomparable. So, you should be very thankful to have a place like this in your neighborhood. To give you an idea uh, of just how important it is that a place like this exists, when I was in grade 9, the last place that we had as Musallah, does anyone remember the previous Musallah? There's this one, but there used to be a Musallah on an upper floor, it's right on 152nd Street. That place used to be an arcade where my friends and I would go. So I watched in my life that place turn from an arcade into a Musallah. Uh, this place was where uh, people would meet up to fight. <laughs> so if there were fights at my school, this is where people would meet up to fight, like right in the parking lot where we parked here. So subhanAllah, in my own life, I've seen this go from a place of facade, a place where people did nothing good, a place effectively of evil, to something that's very good. 
it's very important that you continue coming here and contributing to this masjid. And I'm, I'm not speaking to the adults, I'm speaking to the young people. That it's very important that you continue contributing to the existence of this masala. We will eventually get old. And the people who are already older than me, they're already on their way there. And after that, it's up to you guys. If you stop coming, it's just an empty moment. We may as well stop paying the rent here. So please make sure that you're contributing to this effort. The quality of the masjid is based on the people inside of it. Now, that's the good note that I have to start with today. Is where the Muslimin used to meet and where they used to study. Is this better? So we know that. What we uh, unfortunately have to cover is the rest of that experience. That was a time of unspeakable hardship for the Muslimin. It was not a good time. Um, Mecca at that time had a stratified society where if you were from one of the big, noble, powerful tribes, you may have had a hard time, but you probably were not physically tortured. If you were not, then you were definitely tortured. Uh, there are two major examples. And, and if I have the time, I can probably spend two or three hours just talking about the different torture that the Muslims went through. But uh, the first example that I've covered is uh, Khabbab, the Dadaab, who was a slave. And he was tortured in well, I'll just, after I tell you, that uh, one of the forms in which he was tortured was that he had uh, boiling metal poured on his skin. Later, in the Khilafah of Umar al-Khattab, Umar asked in front of some of the relatively newer Muslims, some of the ones who didn't see Khabbab go through that torture, he said, can I see your scars? Can we see the scars that you have? And Khabbab lifted up his garment and they began to weep. That the wounds were so deep and he was so disfigured that they couldn't look at him. Uh, one of the most important Muslimin, and he's one of the ten promised paradise, was uh, Sa'd ibn Abi Waqqas. Sa'd eventually became a judge in Iraq. And the, the constituents of the Iraq. Now I'm having The constituents of Iraq would complain that sometimes this guy just begins to cry out of nowhere. He just cries for no reason. Like we're in the middle of telling him our, our cases and he just begins to weep. And Ahmad al Khattab asked Sa'd, you know, why is this happening? And he says, sometimes I remember that I watched Khabbab be tortured and I didn't do anything to help him. And I fear that Allah will never forgive me. That even years later, you're talking now over 20 years later, that he still feels so much bent, he feels so much guilt at the torture that Khabbab faced that he can't forgive himself. Uh, it's worth mentioning here, by the way, that Sa'd ibn Abi Waqqas was a child at that time. That he's carrying a burden that he, that is, he shouldn't be carrying. Because in Mecca at that time, he was 12 or 13 years old. Right? In the Futuhat, in the conquest of Iraq, he was in his 30s. So 20, 30 years later, he was a young adult still. He was 20, 30 years old. But he was still carrying the weight of this unspeakable torture that he did not intervene in. So Khabbab is one. Another very uh, famous example is Bilal al-Dilara. 
some of the Sahaba later mentioned that many of us were tortured. And through that torture, many of us said and did things just to make the torture stop. If they wanted us to say things against Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we would have said it. And if they wanted us to say things against Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa we would have said it. They said every one of us at some point cracked under the pressure except Bilal. Bilal had a very specific tormentor. One person who took it as his full-time job to torment Bilal. And that was his owner, Umayya ibn Khalaf. Umayya ibn Khalaf was one of the most powerful people in Mecca. He was one of the chiefs, one of the noble people. And when he found out that Bilal had accepted Islam, he could not tolerate that. That was unacceptable, that his son, his slave, would accept Islam. And so he would have Bilal dragged out in the hot sand <laughs> on his back. And he would have a large boulder placed on his chest. And in the midday, he would leave him there to cook. And I'm not using that word figuratively, because the sand was so hot that his skin would burn. Uh, if you don't believe me of how hot it can get, I was born in Saudi Arabia, but I came here when I was three. I came here when I was his age. But one of my only memories is me being outside and wearing a thaw, like a white you know, amis. And my sandals were too small, and the pavement was so hot that I was walking around on my heels and my mom was laughing at me from a distance. That's one of my only memories of Saudi Arabia. And it, it, I remember it, because for me it was funny as a child, but the pavement was so hot that I couldn't step on it. That's what Bilal was laid on. Of course, not concrete, not sand, but its, it's ability to retain heat is indescribable. It is so hot that it will burn your skin off. Through all of this torture, Bilal Allah, continued the call, Ahad, Ahad, which means one, 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 one God. And that was infuriating for Umayyad, that he would continue carrying out this torture day in and day out, simply because Bilal would not obey him. That he had found a new God to obey. And they really viewed themselves in this way, that they needed to be obeyed and, uh, and listened to at all times. And how could these people worship one God? Uh, his torture did not stop until Abu Bakr, or only Allah, bought him and freed him. And when he paid for him, Umayya said, you know, uh, I would have accepted less, that you actually didn't get a very good deal. If you had made me a lower offer, I would have accepted it. And Abu Bakr Allah, said, had you asked for more, I would have paid it. So I got a very good deal. I don't feel like I got a bad deal. Uh, it will be weeks before we talk about this, but uh, Bilal definitely gets his revenge. We won't talk about that today, because that's weeks later. But I want you to remember the case of Bilal and Umayyad and Khalaf. The uh, last and most famous case of torture that I'll mention today is the case of the first martyrs in Islam uh, of Sumayya and uh, Yasser al-Dilaq. They were the parents of another Sahabi in Ammar, Ammar bin Yasser, Ammar bin Sahar bin Yasser. And I'm going to be honest, the details of their torture is not even appropriate for children. Like I, I can't even go into what actually happened to them. But they were tortured to death. Their torture led to their death. And that is why they are the first shuhada, the first martyrs in Islam. But even through this, there were important lessons that we as Muslimin devised even till today. Yasir, the son of Ammar, sorry, Ammar, the son of Yasir, 
asked Rasulullah sallallahu uh, about their torture because he said that under torture we said things we did not need. We said things about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that we did not need. And we said things about you that we did not need. Have we become kufar? Did we commit kufar in this case? And of course I'm paraphrasing this conversation, but Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa told them that things that are said under the pressure of torture are not held against you in your hisab, in your account. That when you are being tortured, literally when there is a gun to your head and you say things that you don't need, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is just. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not hold people to account on these things because they do not mean that. Uh, in fact, I heard a case a few years ago uh, of a man being tortured in Syria by Syrian military uh, officers, so-called military officers. And when he was being tortured, uh, he would say, Ya Ma, or Ya Ba, and he would call out for his mother and father. And the officers would say, uh, you know, curse your father, curse your mother. So one of the other people being tortured with him said, uh, why are you calling out for your mother and father? Why don't you call out for Allah? And he says, when I call out for Allah, they curse Allah. So I'm calling out for my mother and father because I don't want them to curse Allah. SubhanAllah, the things that you say under these circumstances are not things that are held against you. Now that I've dealt with that, I wanted to cover the who and what of the torturers. And there are a lot of names here, and I don't expect you to remember them all. But I have to share them anyway. So first of all, I want to cover why they felt that Islam was a problem. What were the arguments they made against Islam? And I mentioned in previous talks that everything they had said, most of the arguments that they had said are actually preserved in the Qur'an. Most of the things that they said to criticize Islam or their problems with Islam or their uh, attacks to rebut, to argue against Islam are still preserved in the Qur'an. One of their grievances is that they say that Muhammad وسلم, has combined all of the gods in one. He's amalgamated all of our gods. He has put together all of our gods and put them in one. And they couldn't accept this. Because to them, multiple gods seemed natural. Now that, of course, did not stand up to any intellectual scrutiny. Any intellectual scrutiny would have showed that their aqidah, their, their religion, was very weak. But it was also a problem because their gods were a source of revenue. The people of Ta'if worshipped particular gods and they came to visit the Kaaba, and other people worshipped other gods and they came to visit the Kaaba and worship those gods. And this deed is inter interfering with our whole business model. Our whole business model will be put in jeopardy if you combine all these gods into one. Nobody will visit us anymore. The other thing, or one of the other things that they couldn't accept, and you will find ayat to this effect in the Qur'an is the mockery at the idea that once you die and your bones become dust that Allah is going to put you back together after you have withered away Allah is going to put you back together and resurrect you the word Allah, the name Allah predates Islam they knew Allah they knew of a one God. But in a sense, they were mocking Him. They were mocking Allah with the statement. Oh, Allah is going to put you back together. This is not, we've seen the bones turn into dust. This isn't something that happens. And Allah answers them by telling them that just how you were put together the first time, you will be put together again. Allah created Adam from nothing, from Torah, from clay and dust. Allah created the universe from literally nothing. So for Allah to put these things back together is very easy. It's not, it's, it's not difficult for Allah Azza wa They also had ideas of how to counter Islam politically. 
So now I want to stop here and recount everything that we've gone over so far. The Muslimin were learning at Dar al Arqa, but they had to do it in secret because they were tortured. Their torture was cruel and unusual. And the Quraysh had very particular problems with the deen. Ah, there was a, a really important one that I, I forgot to mention. This is actually maybe the most important. They could not remove themselves from the tradition of their forefathers. That you want us to abandon the religion that our forefathers believed? You want us to leave the deen of Abdul Muttalib, of our greatest hero? You want us, and if you're telling us that, what you are telling us is that our fathers were ignorant, that they were stupid, that they didn't know. This is, of course, how they're uh, repackaging the argument. And they could not accept that. Their forefathers were everything to them. Their lineage was all they had. They didn't have uh, cuisine and the architecture. And their forefathers and their lineage was their claim to fame. That was the reason Quraysh were who they are. That was the only thing that gave them any status among the Arab, their lineage. So now, what do they do about Islam? And here, you will be introduced to a few characters. Go back to the first halakha that we had where I spent the whole time speaking about the lineage of the Arab, of Quraysh. And I mentioned that Quraysh was split into two halves. Abdul Manaf, which is the branch of Rasulullah and Abdul Da. The tribe of Ben Mahzum were the strongest and largest tribe of the Abdul Da branch. And Banu Hashim were their counterparts from the Abdul Manaf half. They were rivals. Abu Sufyan عن, narrates that in the time of Jahiliyyah, Abu Sufyan was the chief of the tribe called Ben Umayyah. And in the time of Jahiliyyah, so Abu Sufyan converted to Islam very late. He will come up a lot in the next halaqa. But him and a man named Amr bin Hisham would eavesdrop on Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam reciting Qur'an in his home. They would sneak out of their homes to listen to Qur'an. And for a few nights in a row, Abu Sufyan would walk around the corner of the home of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and find Amr bin Hisham in his face. They'd say, what are you doing here? They'd say, what are you doing here? They'd say, oh, okay, I was listening to uh, Muhammad reciting Qur'an. He said, okay, I was doing this too. But wallahi, I will not come again. And Amr bin Hisham would say, Wallahi, I will not come again as well. And the next night they would find each other there as well. And this happened for a few nights. Just to listen to the beauty of the words of Allah Azza wa Jalla. So finally Abu Sufyan asked Amr bin Hisham. He said, what are we doing here? Do we, is he, is he right? Is he on the haq, talking about Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? Is he telling, you know, is he uh, the one who's telling the truth? And Amr bin Hisham said, of course he is. Of course he's telling the truth. So again, Abu Sufyan said, so what are we doing? And Amr bin Hisham says, we and Banu Hashim have been in a race forever. And it had come to the point where we were, were like two horses, neck and neck, approaching the finish line. They would produce a poet and we would produce a poet. And they would produce a warrior, and we would produce a warrior. They would produce a wrestler, and we would produce a wrestler. There was nothing that they could do that we couldn't match. And now, they say that a them is one who receives revelations from Allah, from above the seven heavens. How are we going to compete with that? So Wallahi, I will never accept it. This again, was what's called kufr al-istikbar, a kufr, a disbelief of arrogance. They knew that Rasulullah was telling the truth, but their ego would not allow them to accept it. And so, Amr bin Hisham is the one who you know as Abu Jahl. Rasulullah gave him this name, the father of ignorance. Rasulullah said, Abu Jahl, Amr bin Hisham, is the Fir'aun of this Ummah. 
is the Fir'aun of Ummah Muhammad sallallahu Amr bin Hisham was not even the chief of Ben Mahzur, but he was truly exceptional in his animosity to Islam. He was a professional Kafir. Anytime, anywhere that Islam was to be opposed, you found Abu Jahl at the front. He was always there. Some of the other ones had soft spots. They would uh, kind of go in and out. Right? They occasionally felt pity or sorrow or some type of, uh, some type of uh, jahili honor uh, in their dealings with Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Amr al-Hisham had none of that. He was momentous in his court. The chief of Banu Mahzum was a man named Al-Walid ibn al muhira If the part of his name, Al-Walid, sounds familiar, he is the father of Khalid bin Walid. Al-Walid ibn al muhira was Mecca's superstar. He was Mecca's chief poet at a time where the poets were the most honored people in the society. When Mecca would participate in poetry competitions, they would send Al-Walid. He was their champion. He was also uh, the one who they called Abu Hakka, the father of wisdom. And he was wise. Al-Walid was not an idiot. He was wise, and he was handsome, and he was rich. He was special in every way. And Amr bin Hisham came to Al-Walid, came to his chief, and said, you need to figure this problem out. You need to do something about this. And he knew that Al-Walid had the tools to deal with this. What happened next was one of the miracles of the time of Rasulullah Sallallahu And Walid went home and was frustrated with his inability to deal with this problem. So he thought about what he's going to do. This is in what surah? Yes. Surah al So now you know who Allah is referring to in Surah al -Mudathir. That part, that part of the surah, starts with a challenge, or really a threat from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to Al-Walid. The first thing that Allah says before it gets into that is, ذَرْنِي وَمَنْ خَلَقْتُ وَحِيدًا Leave me with the one who I created special. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala acknowledges or recognizes or identifies the fact that Walid was special. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, leave him to me. And I don't think anybody would want to be put in that situation where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is identifying you. And so it goes on. فَقَالَ إِنْ هَذَا سِحْرٌ this is just a, a magic. It's just something that, it's just a magic that's affecting people. This is what al Walid was saying about the ayat of Quran. To Rasulullah وسلم, before al Walid brought them back to the rest of Quraysh. So, these ayat are being revealed in real time. Rasulullah is not sitting with Al Walid while he's plotting and scheming and thinking and, and coming up with these excuses. Rasulullah is not with him. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is revealing what's happening while it's happening. Rasulullah learns about the plan of Al Walid before Quraysh learned about the plan. So, in their meeting place, like their Congress, Al Walid comes back. And he says, before I tell you what I have to say, what do you think we should say about Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? So some say, let's say that he's a liar. So Walid says, we have known him his whole life. He's not a liar. 
He is an Amin, he is the trustworthy. You know that he's not a liar. And they say, let's say that he's a madman, that he's gone crazy. And then Walid says, we've seen the insane. We've seen madmen before. And you know that he's not a madman. So they say, let's say that it's magic. And he says, we've seen magicians. We know the Sahara, we know the magicians. He's not a Sahara. He's not a cat. He's not a soothsayer or a magician. So they say, okay, then what do you think? He says that we know that all of these things are not true. We know that whatever we say is not true. And so Walid was worthy of the title Abu al-Haq. He was wise. But then he goes on and says, that of these, the best one is the lie that he is a magician. So we'll say that. We'll say that he is a magician and that he turns families against one another. That is the story of Al-Walid. The last is the story of a man named Al-Nadhar ibn Al-Had. Al-Nadhar ibn Al-Had was one of the few people in Mecca who had traveled to the lands of the Romans and the Persians. So he was a worldly person. And <laughs> In the days before Instagram, people who traveled and didn't take pictures, they'd come back and tell their stories of the travels that they went to. They didn't have hashtags on this. Silly things. So, another of the hadith would come back with the stories of the Persians and the Romans and the Egyptians and who the other people he had seen. And when he would hear Rasulullah reciting Quran, he would come and start telling a story of the Persians or something else. And then he would close off by saying, See, he has stories and I have stories. Asatil al awwaleen. These are just old stories of old people. Not Habib. Yeah, Ukhud. He would say, These are just the old stories of old people. That's all this is. Even though they knew better, these are the excuses that they came up with. I need to close off on one note. That yes, during the torture, the torture phase, we could call it, in Mecca, Rasulullah was not lashed and whipped. But he also experienced humiliations and oppression that is unspeakable. Uh, the worst of which was one time when Rasulullah was in sujood in front of the Kaaba. A man named Uqba ibn Abi Mu'ayyir threw the rotting carcass of a dead camel, of the entrails, the insides of a dead camel, on the back of Rasulullah. Um, dead animals are. Generally speaking, disgusting. Even when they're freshly dead, like if you've ever uh, butchered, uh, much the butchering of a cow or a lamb, the stuff that's inside it is not pleasant. It's worse when it's rotting, when it's been out in the sun for days or weeks. No, nobody from Quraysh actually wanted to do this. Amr bin Hisham had said, "Who among you will do this?" It would be like asking someone to pick up feces, to pick up dung, to pick up something disgusting. Uqba was such a disgusting person that he was Uqba ibn Abi Mu'ayyah. Alayka bi al-Walid ibn al-Mughira. Alayka bi Uqba ibn Rabi'ah. Alayka bi Umayyah ibn Khalaf. He said, Oh Allah, I leave Amr ibn Hisham to you. I leave Uqba ibn Abi Mu'ayyah to you. I leave Utbah ibn Rabi'ah to you. I leave Al Walid ibn al Mughira to you. I leave Umayyah ibn Khalaf to you. Every single one of those people who Rasulullah made a dua against dies in the battle of battle. Do not oppress anyone. This is a hadith of Rasulullah. Do not oppress anyone, for there is no barrier between Allah and the dua of an oppressed person. And in this case, the oppressed person was Rasulullah 
Every single one of those people dies in the Battle of Badr. Their power and their wealth and their wisdom and their connections, all of it did nothing to protect them. I'll end there for today. Because next time I want to speak about the Islam of two of the most important people in the history of Islam, who are Hamza ibn Abdul Muttalib, the uncle of the Prophet وسلم, and Umar ibn Khattab So I'll conclude there. But do we have any questions?